the future is not bright. At least, not if you're reading the most popular interpretations of the future. AI uprisings, ecological crises, mass surveillance states, and wartime apocalypses dominate speculative fiction, from novels to Netflix. It seems inevitable that in the coming decades, our world will become an increasingly worse and uninhabitable place, fueled by the real dangers of climate inaction, militaristic tension, and a crumbling public sphere. There's genuine reason to worry. People find themselves glued to the apocalypse, escaping to social media to endlessly scroll and consume news of the impending collapse. Some embrace doomerism, an extremely pessimistic and nihilistic worldview that has entirely given up hope for a better future. As with all art, speculative fiction tends to reflect the sentiments of the era. During the Great Depression, for example, Superman first appeared taking down evil businessmen and bankers, the villains of the day. In fact, the golden age of comic books was spawned in part by the anxiety of the Second World War, with new superheroes like The Flash, Wonder Woman, and Captain America taking down mad scientists and wartime foes. These were everyday people who found themselves with the supernatural ability to solve problems and fight bad guys all on their own. For readers, it was a release from the anxiety-filled thoughts of helplessness and isolation and the madness of war that consumed nations. And it's arguably the reason why superhero films have made a resurgence today. Speculative fiction continued to mirror our social anxieties throughout the 20th century. Atomic warfare in the 1950s through The Day the Earth Stood Still and On the Beach, the techno-laden data mines in the 1980s through Robocop and The Terminator, dystopian hyper-capitalism in the 1990s like Ghost in the Shell and The Matrix, or environmental catastrophe in recent decades through Mad Max, Waterworld, The Day After Tomorrow, and WALL-E. Yet in response to a collective dystopian narrative, some sought to imagine different futures for a better tomorrow. In times of profound hope, authors and filmmakers speculated on what it would be like if humans did solve problems. During the space age, Gene Roddenberry invented Star Trek, demonstrating a united future of humans and aliens combating the world's problems together. It questioned militarism and authoritarianism and featured the first black woman in a lead role, Michelle Nichols. Then, in the 1970s, Marge Piercy wrote Woman on the Edge of Time, where a Hispanic woman is wrongfully incarcerated due to her violent tendencies, but is given a vision from the future which depicts a world that's embraced the counterculture movement of the 70s, including the elimination of sexism, homophobia, and imperialism. In contrast to something like The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood, reading utopian speculative fiction can be a disarming experience. Is it naive to imagine a future where people live in harmony? And in the late 2000s, the concept of solar punk emerged. YouTube channel Our Changing Climate with Andrewism published an overview of solar punk, saying, Ultimately, solar punk envisions a world that might be slower, but more intentional, one that ties humanity closely to the natural world. And as Andrewism put in the replies, a future with a human face and dirt behind its ears. But if solar punk is the future with humanity put back in, achieving it means taking control of that future from economic, social, and political forces that seem to be on autopilot to self-destruction utterly divorced from human desires and human intervention. One path we've imagined already in its grimy survivalist individualism was the defining feature of Reagan-era science fiction classics. However, in its radical reimagination of economic and social structures, solar punk resists the nihilism and doomerism of the grim, dehumanized technological dystopias that dominated the worlds of Blade Runner, Robocop, and William Gibson's Neuromancer. Do we have the willingness to challenge the predominant social, economic, and political structures and systems that need to be challenged? To change the very nature of humanity's relationship to the planet? And what role does education play in all this?
In July 2022, Dr. Henry Giroux presented a keynote at the inaugural Conference to Restore Humanity, where he spoke on the topic of critical pedagogy in a time of fascist tyranny. In this keynote, he connects our fading visions of the future to the lack of hope that we can ever actually imagine something radically different from the present. The commanding visions of democracy are in exile at all levels of education. Critical thought and the imagining of a better world present a direct threat not only to white supremacists, but also to those ideologues who narrowly embrace a corporate vision of the world in which the future always replicates the present in an endless circle in which capital and the identities that it legitimates merge with each other into what might be called a dead zone of the imagination and pedagogies of repression. And more simply evoked by theorist Mark Fisher, it is easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And that's a well we have absolutely run dry in our desire for dystopia. We've imagined the world destroyed by AI, by climatological disaster, even by zombies. Judging by pop culture, you could assume we have a preference for annihilation. Stuck in this doom loop, we've created an entire media apparatus that not only imagines ever worsening and horrific futures, but nostalgizes the past to keep us trapped in existing banal dystopias. In an era of increasingly rehashed ideas, corporations now openly flaunt reboot culture, negating any ability to imagine something new. Nothing comforts anxiety like a little nostalgia haunts The Matrix Resurrections as a 2021 sequel to the nearly 20-year-old trilogy. Escaping the drudgery of futures imagined for us is no small feat. Philosopher Jean Baudrillard believed that our world had become so engrossed in the hyper-real that we are no longer able to distinguish between what is real and what is imagined. Or, as he wrote on Disneyland, It's meant to be an infantile world, in order to make us believe that the adults are elsewhere in the real world, and to conceal the fact that real childishness is everywhere, particularly among those adults who go there to act the child in order to foster illusions of their real childishness. Teaching is the most stressful job in America. 86% of teachers report being stressed, 73% struggle with anxiety, and 67% with ongoing depression. And even amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, these shocking statistics dwarf healthcare workers and other highly stressful positions. So it isn't surprising that so many educators have become jaded and nihilistic about the state of education. Stressed, depressed, and demoralized teachers who are looking for an exit or believe that their classrooms have become a lost cause are less likely to be able to create spaces of joy, wonder, and curiosity for students because, at the end of the day, why does any of it matter? The Doom Loop connects a dismal view of the future to lived realities within classrooms everywhere. Underfunded, risk-averse schools are pressured to adopt an empty or scripted pedagogy a standardized system where the same thing is taught the same way to every student. In this way, the ends justify the means, sold as a back-to-basics way to alleviate teacher stress and improve outcomes by simplifying instruction and assessment, standardizing classroom management, and securing higher scores by aligning curriculum with the demands of state tests. With the best intentions, Empty pedagogy means to make it easier to produce similar outcomes for all students. But the reality is that it's easier to sell scripted curriculum to a deprofessionalized workforce that lacks the collective power to make pedagogical decisions, or even the collective understanding that there could be other educative outcomes worth pursuing. An empty pedagogy eliminates the need for advanced degrees, certifications, and the deep pedagogical understanding that comes from years of experience. Opting instead to treat educators like easily replaceable, low-skill, low-wage employees at the bottom of a technocratic hierarchy. Of course, it also removes the artistry and personal connection that draws virtually all teachers to the profession, replacing purpose-driven professionals with trained technicians thus perpetuating the doom loop as educators burn out in a profession void of personal identity and the capacity for meaningful action. As teachers burn out, it can be tempting to embrace scripted techniques to make the job easier, but this can be dangerous at the level of the system itself. 
The more schools come to value an empty pedagogy, the more sterile the classroom becomes. And the more sterile the classroom becomes, the more classrooms become isolated from society. Unable to address the problems of today, let alone the future, content to batch process students with standards and objectives, but rarely in a direction or with a purpose. Of course, young people can find this on their own, but systems that embrace the back-to-basic standardization of classroom curriculum lead young people to have to fight back against the demeaning and soul-sucking nature of school. In this way, schools become a vector of the doom loop itself. The majority of young people also find themselves bored, stressed, or tired in high school. Horrifically, the suicide rate of students increases between 30 to 43 percent during the school year. And as chronicled in Huck magazine, young people are embracing nihilism. One young person states, we are all just little grains of sand on a seemingly infinite beach. And numerous accounts show people not bothering to fight for just causes, such as environmentalism or social justice, because, after all, what's the point if the apocalypse is right on the horizon? The promise of a college-to-career pathway with a livable wage, stable job prospects in a decently-sized home, nuclear family, and other elements of the American dream have become structurally unattainable. But the article also outlines the growing movement of positive or sunny nihilism. Australian writer Wendy Seifert says that nihilism can be a gateway to a radical decentralization of the self saying, if you have been forced to recognize that the things you thought were going to promise you a good life aren't available anymore, you look beyond yourself to protect something bigger. She believes that when you embrace nihilism, you can start to recognize what the philosopher Nietzsche said about rules, laws, and morals. They're all social constructs. You can begin to reimagine yourself and the world around you in entirely different ways. And it becomes liberating to change the world because you recognize that all of it is, well, made up, as one young person puts it. It doesn't matter to me that it will all return to nothingness eventually. It exists simultaneously with my existence, and I get to climb trees, run about, and swim, all thanks to the Earth. Human existence is beautiful, even if it's all for nothing. All we are is dust in the wind, dude. Just as Mark Fisher's capitalist realism argued that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism, there's a striking similarity to modern schooling. In a sense, we're living with educational realism, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than imagine a fundamental change in K-12 education. And both systems, capitalism and education, directly connected in so many ways, are just a couple hundred years old at most, a drop in the bucket in the scale of human history. However, unlike changing capitalism, the calls to change K-12 education should be a lighter lift. It's an institution that ends for most people at 18 years old, the experience of schooling can be profoundly negative in lasting ways, particularly for marginalized people. And it doesn't even really work to arm students with an awareness of the market capitalism that determines how so much of our society operates. What is it even for, anyway? This isn't to say that education reform should occur in a vacuum, away from general societal welfare, but that it should at least be possible to imagine that the K-12 schooling system can change, and change quickly, from the bottom up. Things don't have to be the way they are, as the late David Graeber reminds us, saying, the ultimate hidden truth of the world is that it is something we make, and could just as easily make differently. And there are efforts around the globe to lessen the negative impact of school and build a more purposeful education system. In light of growing concerns about the future of our society and planet, we need to reimagine education now. We often hear reformers and activists say that the work they're doing won't be realized within their lifetimes, and that's partially true, as Professor Toby Rollo states. Social justice is an intergenerational project. The hardest thing to accept is that you're not going to be the one who crosses the finish line. It's not a sprint, it's not a marathon, it's a relay. Yet each individual runner in the relay is still pushing themselves and their team to go faster. Every millisecond counts, and it's on the team working together to win. 
This is not a race we can afford to lose. As we've seen decades of attempts at top-down accountability reform fail to achieve much, beyond the immiseration of students and the deprofessionalization of teachers, a grassroots, human-centered reimagining of education is a necessary part of the process. It in itself is a form of activism to change the world, one in which adults and students work together to see that every young person has the motivation to find their purpose and the capacity to act compassionately in their community, using local action as the driver of real-world solutions to problems that have now become existential threats to humanity. It isn't hyperbole. As mocked in the film Don't Look Up about an inevitable extinction-level impact with a meteor and an almost too real allegory of how the world is dealing with the climate crisis, the scientist who exclaims, Oh, 100% for sure gonna oh. die! <laughs> should be a greater motivator for swift collective action. These nihilistic perspectives will likely lead us down one of three roads. The first, more and more people give up to the point where the apocalypse becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and humanity dies out or becomes a fraction of its former self through some combination of accident, neglect, and malicious action. Two, more and more people give up to the point where Mark Fisher's banal capitalist realist dystopia becomes a reality if it hasn't already. Existential problems get solved slowly and in patchwork ways, but society operates as a place of pointlessness, going through the motions while more and more suffer. Or three, more and more people begin to act, bit by bit, recognizing that by coming together and chipping away at problems from a number of angles, it is actually not that difficult to solve these problems in short order. If we're all contributing our collective strengths, it'll be a lighter lift. We have the capacity for action. What we need is hope that this is all worth doing. Solarpunk gives us the permission to imagine differently, to resist Giroux's dead zones of imagination. The simple act of having hope for a better future breaks the doom loop and builds a platform for action. In Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents, the main character, Lauren Olamina, digs and leads others to this well of hope amidst climatological and man-made disaster, disruption, and mass death along the American West Coast. Spreading the philosophy of Earthseed, she writes in her book of the living, the destiny of Earthseed is to take root among the stars. A different world is possible if we overcome the distortion of our senses and see beyond broken systems. By setting our sights towards something new, we can reveal solutions that already exist today. As Adrian Marie Brown, an organizer and author whose work is heavily influenced by Octavia Butler's Afrofuturism, wrote in her book, Emergent Strategy, Shaping Change, Changing Worlds, I would call our work to change the world science fictional behavior. Being concerned with the way our actions and beliefs now, today, will shape the future, tomorrow, the next generations, we are excited by what we can create. We believe it is possible to create the next world. We believe. Educators play an incredibly important role in society. As conduits of knowledge transmission and as allies and mentors to young people who find themselves adrift in an increasingly complex and hostile world. As the pandemic alienated young people and educators alike from their usual learning environments, Many embraced and flourished in new virtual spaces and new ways of organizing their education in science fiction made reality. However, in the years since, progress in reimagining our social, economic, and educational arrangements has been virtually erased in the forced return to normalcy. Educators' capacity to push back against normalcy seems increasingly futile. With profiteering standardized testing companies decrying learning loss, and many districts embracing the safe structures of the past that failed to serve many, arguably most, students. It is incredibly easy to become fatalistic about public education. Why bother saving it? After all, it has done harm to so many and we face so many problems today. Yet, we need reimagined schools and public education now more than ever. Urgent problems like climate change require immediate, widespread, and collective action. They require a humane education that ensures all students are critical, empathetic agents in their communities 
and on the global stage. How do we do this? We embody, we learn, we release the idea of failure because it's all data. But first, we imagine. We are in an imagination battle. If we embrace dystopia, if we embrace doomerism, we lose hope as a platform for action in the present. In assuming that incremental change is hopeless against entropy, we either embrace the darkness or put our faith in panaceas, magic potions, grifters, charlatans, and superhero teams who will emerge from the shadows and fix everything. We become locked in a stasis and fail to do anything at all. In other words, the failure to reimagine education and our fundamental relationship to the future becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The future depends on educators in coalition with other movements to create an equitable society, to demand and make change here in the present. Imagining a better future isn't naivete. It's essential for a thriving world. We must preserve in the face of everything a positive outlook toward organizing, surviving, and building anew, or risk becoming stagnant. Individual actions snowball and propagate through systems, and each act of service, each pushback, each classroom decision can fundamentally build a better future. It's up to us to make that tomorrow a reality. Imagining a better future isn't naivete. It's essential for a thriving world. We must preserve in the face of everything a positive outlook toward organizing, surviving, and building anew, or risk becoming stagnant. Individual actions snowball and propagate through systems, and each act of service, each pushback, each classroom decision can fundamentally build a better future. It's up to us to make that tomorrow a reality. If we can't articulate more viable futures and adapt, Adrian Marie Brown cautions, our human future is pretty hopeless. So what is it about the world that is worth preparing students for? And are we dedicated to the work of building that better world alongside them? We must stand in solidarity with young people and build spaces of proactive action, where students move beyond rote memorization and towards service, cooperation, self-determination, and purpose finding. We must co-create learning spaces in all communities for all learners, where young people have power in shaping their classrooms and curriculums. We must fight for human rights and ensure that all people are valued, respected, and loved, willing to leverage our own power and privilege to stand up for marginalized, oppressed peoples. We must counter the anti-democratic movement to deprofessionalize teachers and treat them like technicians, recognizing that this movement can and will bring about the end of public education. We must resist calls for back to basics. Those who believe the value and purpose of education is in the storage and recall of predetermined lists of facts. This process repeats itself as a destructive feedback loop to the sterilization of classrooms and an inoculation of our collective imagination. And we must not lose sight of a better future. What could a day at Solar Punk High School look like? Let's imagine together. With test scores out of the way, the Department of Education recognizes and research supports that much of the existing educational model harms students. They've reframed what it means to be successful by interviewing students, community members, teachers, academics, businesses, nonprofits, and more, and found that almost everyone wants students to be engaged, nurtured, loved, purposeful, and learned. Based on this, they've made the following changes, which are tied to school's federal funding. Standardized test scores are no longer used. In conjunction with various organizations, a portfolio system has been developed where students present their body of work to prospective colleges and careers. Coursework, while still tied to basic reading, writing, mathematics, and other essential skills, is now much more open-ended. States cannot require overly specific content and are required to use student and teacher input to develop an interdisciplinary curriculum for their community. An anti-racist and equity-driven review board has concluded that all students should be exposed to a variety of texts, speakers, and concepts. Teachers must include perspectives in the classroom for all learners. Grade-level batch processing is phased out. Under the age of 18, all students work through curriculums in their local public schools that allow them to tackle objectives at their own desired level. 
public schools and teachers have received drastically increased funding. This allows for schools to offer a variety of different experiences for different learners, have much smaller class sizes, have required planning periods, and are paid much, much more. There is mandatory representation of students and teachers on school boards. And all student debts are canceled. Public colleges are tuition free. All young people are encouraged to pursue their goals and aspirations with or without college. Beyond this, other systems across the community have changed to support young people as well. The criminal justice system has taken steps to lessen incarceration and focus on community building and restorative practice. Everyone has been provided a universal basic income to avoid living in extreme poverty. Sustainability efforts have converted much of humanity's consumption to renewables, building more and more green spaces to restore habitats and wildlife, and everyone has access to quality public resources such as great libraries and free internet. Your school day begins. Similar to a liberal arts college, almost everyone has a different schedule. Over the summer, groups of students and educators, representing a wide range of backgrounds and perspectives, met and planned a range of engaging coursework for students to choose from. They hired additional teachers and assistants, which include community members and older students. These classes are offered throughout the day, depending on scheduling, with various busing times to arrive on campus. Many courses are also offered off-site in the community itself or online. You've signed up for Introduction to Robotics and Drone Piloting at 9.30 a.m., have a break from 11 until 11.30 with Gothic Horror and Literature, then wrap up Monday at 1 o'clock with Community Service. You prefer to end the day relatively early, while summer on campus until late evening. You have different classes on Tuesday and Thursday and Fridays off. All of these classes are interesting to you and they're aligned with broad national standards the required concepts that all students must meet, and your advisor helped you choose this selection at the beginning of the year. Due to increased funding paid for by marginal wealth taxes, all students have access to any and all resources, accommodations, and supports they would need to be successful. And class sizes are kept small, averaging 10 to 15 students per class. No grades are given, Instead, students document what they're doing in their classes, often designing their own project concepts and adding them to a portfolio. This portfolio is then sent on to colleges or displayed on a resume. The school has been divided into many smaller wings. Some wings are loud with hands-on experiments and a lot of active movement. Some are more traditional for students who desire the old school curriculum. Others are a midpoint. Students transition between these wings at any given moment and collectively enforce community norms that were discussed at an early year seminar. Sometimes students who frequently break the norms will be required to attend a session between teachers, administrators, and other students about their behavior. At 11.30, you walk into Miss Jones' class for Gothic Horror and Literature. This is one of four unique classes she teaches over four days, which was approved based on her own expertise and student interest. The Gothic horror classroom is simple and homely. It looks like an overly sized living room. Various comfy seats covered by shaded lamps fill the room. There's a lot of space to walk around and lounge. You're joined by nine peers who sit around the room and get ready for class to start. Some of the students are much younger than you. You're surprised they're able to read these books with you. You think they're fairly challenging. You've been reading Dracula, which everyone agreed would be a good place to start in Gothic horror. Miss Jones offers some discussion questions to start things off, then other students begin leading the prompts organically. This conversation takes the entire period, and some students say farewell and leave, while others stick around and keep talking. Miss Jones encourages everyone to journal, write about, present on, really do anything that documents their involvement with the book. She meets with students in and out of class to help them develop their thoughts and take them further, but there's no grades. Because of the small class sizes and self-selected classes, there's not many discipline issues, and those that do exist are resolved through organic restorative practice. And because the class is interest-driven and no one is ranked or filed, students of all skill levels are welcome to contribute and grow as learners. You stop by the campus food court for lunch. 
Partnerships with local farms and eateries means that you can order any food you'd like, and it's paid for by the school. Some regulations mean that all food is relatively healthy, but all quality and fresh. You're happy with all the options, everything from simple traditional meals to international offerings that change day to day. And it's cool that many of the eateries are operated by students' family members. You're scheduled to meet with your advisor today, who is part of a team looking after your progress. Sometimes you'll meet with different advisors to get a different opinion. Their goal is to ensure you're doing well and that you're having the proper supports in your classes and that your classes are sufficiently interesting and challenging. You explain that everything is great, but you wish the school had more art offerings. They share with you a nonprofit connection in the community and recommend its elaborate free art program. At the end of the day, you leave campus. In some ways, your home life is blended. In a healthy sense, you recognize that you should leave most of your studies at school and should take time for yourself, but you also enjoy a good challenge. You look for other modern Gothic horror titles online and find Silvia Morena Garcia's Mexican Gothic, and you begin to read it so you can share a recommendation with your classmates tomorrow. You figure the other students may find it interesting. So what do you think? Is this the educational environment you would have wanted for yourself or that you want for your own children? What parts of this reimagination of school are worth building toward? How do we begin to get there? And what parts of the world can you influence to help get us there? As long as we keep imagining, keep pushing, keep resisting, and keep taking action, we can build a better world together. Don't let the system rob you of your hope and your imagination. As Octavia Butler wrote in the Book of Earthseed, belief initiates and guides action, or it does nothing. The Human Restoration Project is a nonprofit dedicated to informing and spreading progressive education through free educational programs, resources, and online materials for teachers, families, and students. You can learn more and follow us at humanrestorationproject.org or on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and post at HumRes Pro. Be sure to add the hashtag RestoreHumanity.